Hi there, my name is Pat Gunn, and I'm going to be talking about some ideas I have for a tabletop uh, game series called Mage the Ascension. It's a series I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, I came across it through TV tropes, and just I was fascinated by the lore of the system. It's connected to a, a number of other table, tabletop games from uh, White Wolf. And later on, it unfortunately ended up being taken over by a series. Uh, well, White Wolf had a series of mergers, and they kind of landed up in some screwed up hands. I don't really appreciate a lot of the more recent work on it, but the original game, uh, its source material and the surrounding games are pretty fascinating. So I wanted to offer my spin on Mage the Ascension, which is probably my favorite uh, game in, in the expanded world of the White Wolf. Uh, um, this uh, the, that the games all the separate games have uh, all have a naming habit like Werewolf the Apocalypse, Mage the Ascension, this the that. Uh, so that's how you can recognize them and you can get them all on, uh, I think, what is it? Uh, there's there's an online PDF store, uh, that uh, drive through RPG, that, that you can use to buy a lot of the older, uh, older books. And in general, I mean, you can get the whole series, you can get the new stuff too. Uh, uh, but so this is my take on them. And that uh, I used to, to run D&D settings. I really enjoy digging into the details of lore, uh, stuff like that, and creating new settings. I do have a D&D setting that I probably should share at some point, but uh, just, I, 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 just world building is fun. Uh, designing these systems, building themes, stuff like that, it's, it's enjoyable for me. And in particular, I, I also have a certain amount of resentment for uh, certain very recent cultural trends like 2007 and onwards that have ruined a lot of games or at least made them less cool than they could be. Uh, and usually the, the best way to deal with this, it's not to complain, it's just to produce more cultural stuff. And so that's what I'm doing. This is my spin on Mage the Ascension. Um, go use this have fun with it uh i my general attitude towards tabletop rpgs is the D, &D uh, or the dm or equivalent can do whatever they want and they can make new settings change rules whatever it, it doesn't really matter uh if uh, the, the players just kind of have to accept that because that's what it is to be a player and to deal with a, a dm you find a dm that you like dms find players that they like hopefully they get along and uh, have a good time with sharing the storytelling and uh, good gaming. Anyhow, so let's let's get into it. Uh, this is a setting which I call Mage Return. At least I'm calling it that now. It might not be the best name. It's a little stereotypical, but uh, what can you do? Um, and so I'll just be reading through a certain amount of the large amount of material that I've produced uh, for it. Um, right now I'm just sharing all this stuff freely on Google Drive not making any profit uh, off of it. These are just ideas, I'm not selling it. Uh, yada yada, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's anything legally risky in any of that. Uh, maybe if I were selling it, bundling it, printing it, yada yada. But I, but I think just offering ideas like this is probably pretty safe. So, to run this setting, <clears throat> we're going to entirely ignore events from 20th edition and any later editions of Mage Ascension that are published. Bringing in spells and devices can be fine, maybe some flavoring. Uh, there's going to be a time shift uh, in this series, and that invalidates a lot of the history of 20th edition. Uh, so I'd recommend just really, before trying to run this, really get familiar with the revised uh, third edition rule books. And having some familiarity with earlier versions of the rule books is also a good idea. And the history from the second edition books is more authoritative than the revised edition. Uh, and so particularly with this, we're going to get rid of the idea of void adaptation and disembodiment. Uh, we'll mark them as not a thing. Although I am working the idea of threat null uh, into the ca campaign in a kind of complicated uh, way, but they were not created through void adaptation 
that not created through void adaptation in this setting. Um, we're going to dial down the pogrom significantly due to the technocracy losing yet another member. Uh, there will be some new threats, but we're also going to try and ramp up political intrigue and cultural battles. Uh, uh, the uh, Horizon Realms are generally still around, as is the old leadership. But threats, uh, Threat Null is beginning to assimilate parts of the Union and mundane people, while uh, Nefendi remain a constant threat. Setting it in the 1970s or the 80s is doable. Setting it in modern day is also doable. Some adjustments to procedures and tools should be made to fit the decade chosen. Pay attention to the timeline for, for historical shifts. Uh, I'm also just going to rule out the idea that's floated that's been floating around in the rule books for a long time. There is no tenth sphere. It's a common myth of the traditions, but it's just a myth, nothing more. Uh, the myth does exist in world, but uh, there really isn't a tenth sphere. And even the nine spheres, we're going to just consider them to be significantly the result of tradition understandings of the world. Ascension itself is also marked as a myth, a common myth of the traditions and to a certain extent the technocracy. Again, nothing more, although searching for it gives a lot of mages meaning. And there are some altered states of being and or minds that uh, uh, mages can find. Nefendi use regular spheres. We're going to toss out any idea that the kilopic uh, spheres uh, are meaningful as a concept. Uh, their mindset and goals don't shape their use of magic, except when intended, with the exception of resonance. The apocalypse is not a thing. Time keeps on going on, although existential risks crop up and humanity will likely eventually fall to one of them. We're going to emphasize multi-sided conflict and the difficulty of showing wisdom or finding safety uh, while doing mercy. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of tragedy of conflict as a theme, a lot of human stupidity uh, and complexity of the world. We're going to dial down technocratic concerns about mutualism mentioned in the very recent rule books because the technocracy is practical enough to not worry about such things. So get rid of uh, the vast majority of that stuff. Um, and uh, let's go into, um, I'm looking at a big list of documents. Uh, we're going to get into, let's see, do we want to talk about that? No, because historical reason, yeah, we'll, we'll ignore that. Um, uh, do, 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 ideas documents. Ba -do, ba -do. Okay, so these are the ideas that we're starting from um, when it comes to a lot of the variable stuff that, that's portrayed as options when you're running a Mage the Ascension campaign. Uh, and there's a few reasons that I just want to cover up front uh, as to our input. We, we don't want an end to the series. Um, so that's why the apocalypse is out because it starts to go stale or it starts to fall off from reality. There's just no good reason to have an apocalypse. Uh, there may have been a publishing reason to do it. Might be, oh, the drama, but it's just not interesting. Um, a number of the changes that the Avatar Storm were introduced reduced the wonder from the world. That may have been shaping it to be a little bit more concrete and stuff, but I think it made things way less interesting. Uh, and some promising themes from before they introduced the Avatar Storm become underexplored and some promising settings are also worth exploring that were marked as mostly out of bounds or possibly destroyed. Void adaptation also just never really made a lot of sense uh, to me. So these are the ideas uh, that we're, we're starting from. Firstly, the regular timeline happened, but the Avatar Storm was a result of warfare from Void engineers formatting space in ways that threatened the minor outposts of alien powers in space. And I realize that is probably where you're, you're, if you're familiar with the setting, aliens are not a big part of the classic uh, World of Darkness. And I'm going to have them be not a daily part, but they're important to the history that we're going to be laying out. So Void Engineers continue, they were expanding outwards from Earth 
and they were formatting space and they eventually ran into other uh, powers that were out there and started to reformat their existing outposts, things like that. Populations of those alien outposts became relics and faded from that reality. And so, uh, actually, do I have a history doc? Well, no, this is just kind of an ideas doc. Okay, no, I think this is probably the best doc to be working from. Um, void adaptation was uh, was actually actually I probably should rewrite that. We're gonna we're gonna mark that as crossed off and something to revisit because I probably wrote it first. Um, so threat null did not happen as a result of void adaptations so much as uh, stranded technocracy having a very, very long time to evolve outside of Earth, which was frozen in time. Basically, those alien powers did not like seeing, uh, seeing the technocracy conquering bits of space. So they fired a weapon at Earth, uh, froze it in time, mostly worked, but people who were caught uh, outside of uh, that bubble, time continued and there were thousands of years that passed. It eventually devolved and uh, freed an earth that didn't even notice that the time had passed. Although remnants of the border remained and created problems. So there's a little bit of something like an avatar storm that's present, but it's the result of the that those temporal bubbles uh, not having settled down. Um, now, the Void Engineers militarized further, and in the name of protecting Earth, they turned uh, what could have been a wake-up call, like don't mess with other colonized planets. Instead, they tried to uh, to go uh, go to war with uh, with those aliens, and they got their ass kicked. And so those other powers uh, decided to exterminate humanity. And so they've. Uh, uh, but near the end, open low-grade conflict between the New World Order and Void Engineers had opened. This has been hinted at in the rule books for a long time, particularly as the New World Order uh, operatives discovered the deprocessing on most Void Engineers. So they had put the VEs on probation and removed a lot of their contributions from the timetable. And in retaliation, Void Engineers mostly removed them from space. And uh, as, as the weapons started to heat up uh, Earth, because that was the, the way that the aliens decided to wipe out humanity after losing a few more minor outposts and the humans did not behave, um, they, they fired a weapon at Earth that increased its temperature by a certain number, a small number of degrees every year, but humans were gonna bake. So, an old contingency plan was pulled out from the technocratic union. Uh, starting in the days of the Order of Reason as Existential Threats Project established two plans to protect humanity from any number of threats it might face. The, uh, the first was to establish a gate through which future leadership could return to the past and guide the order away from whatever mistakes it had made. Paradox would devastate all who passed through the gate but if some percentage made it through sane and intact, they could avert disaster. Um, great care was taken not to send anyone through into a period that their earlier selves inhabited, but this plan failed. Paradox destroyed the effort, obliterating the, the countryside around uh, Glastonbury Tor and the doomed timeline, made some weird uh, effects there in the, in the revised timeline that we'll be laying out. Red haze in the air, visions of flames on windy days. The second contingency plan was to send a small set of, uh, of partners through to meet existing leadership who were co continually greased in time to lessen paradox. Uh, so they'd be traveling back in time with a, message, uh, with a message to their partners past selves. This plot project was in place for hundreds of years with the place continually honed to, uh, to the task. Uh, Chosen members of each convention were continually uh, altered for their entire lives while with the project so that they would be the designated survivors. And the general parameters of the target time were locked into place. Maybe a little bit too locked for later taste because this was set up in the era when the Electrodyne engineers 
and the analytical reckoners were still part of the technocracy. Anyhow, as, the, as it became clear that the plan may need to be uh, activated, the technocracy was forced to recruit members of their former conventions for the project. And uh, also, the idealist, idealistic parts of the technocracy made sure that they dominated selection for the project, but four members of each convention were sent. And one agent and two residents, these are uh, threat null, Factions had infiltrated the travelers and took the slots of their corresponding technocrats. And uh, the project was always designed in a way where the avatars uh, of the people who were sent through were, were locked. Uh, but it turns out the threat null people were, uh, had similar enough avatars to their ancestor conventions to fit in in their stead. Um, and, and this, this is largely on the same principles that the uh, um, that uh, the etherites and uh, the modern etherites were able to stand in for the electrodynes and the uh, virtuals for the analytical reckoners. And so they sent people backwards in time through this device as the planet heated up and people started to bake. Most of them arrived in the past with nausea, permanent paradox, and in the need of months of recovery. The travel was not instantaneous. They were locked in essentially a dark room in a void. And this was unplanned for. Uh, they hadn't modeled it as being part of how it would work. They were actually stuck in there for weeks. Uh, and there were a lot of, there was a lot of time for uh, them to converse and think. Uh, the representatives of the void engineers, Sons of Ether and Virtual Depths found common cause during their journey and made, managed to modify the parameters of the temporal transit uh, so that their people uh, ended up arriving uh, a year early. And they arrived in ether space instead of real space. Uh, the travel target was 1960 and they arrived just outside of Ist uh, Istanbul. And so you get these people from uh, from the slight future, landing in the past, and history didn't uh, follow the same way. The Void Engineers immediately departed to the COP, which was still under uh, destruction, uh, still under construction. Uh, details of this involve secrets of how the COP was built and by, by whom, and from there they need to do some policy adjustments and begin needed diplomacy uh, in order to prevent the Avatar Storm and uh, uh, really very quickly start to write an alien contact protocol. The virtual depths were largely spared the effect of the virus that affected them after leaving the technocracy because they knew it was going to happen. And the travelers managed to use their knowledge of the future uh, and knowledge of the leaders to blackmail their way to their policy ends uh, when their partnership was not enough. Uh, the Void Engineers, Virtual Depths, and Ethernauts eventually ended up uh, withdrawing from their respective orgs and they formed a organization called the Circle of Reason. Under the leadership of those who went back and their partners, they made a play for power in many areas where the techno uh, technocracy reigned and the struggle still ongoing and messy. There's going to be a lot of intrigue in this setting. They were less successful on the ground than they anticipated. Uh, they mostly lost their highest value targets. But they got some solid footing in some parts of Asia, the Pacific, Portugal, and Switzerland. And apart from Autochthonia, they have unrivaled control of space, which is really what they cared the most about uh, in order to prevent uh, the mess that had wiped out humanity in the original timeline. The Void Engineers largely purged the technocracy from mid to deep space for a time, maintaining with the Aetherites a nearly exclusive control over spacefaring technologies uh, and the ability to pass deeper into space. Uh, the circle of reason is somewhat out in the open. They hold science fears around the world to press their version of the timetable and weaken the technocratic consensus. The technocracy's pogrom, as it was, uh, was weakened, but it didn't end. And it didn't uh, generally extend to the circle of reason, although they were happy to kidnap and brainwash individuals who interested uh, them enough. Uh, we're gonna wipe out the idea of the disparate alliance. It never formed. It never really 
was a particularly good idea anyhow. Um, so I would never recommend playing with it, even if you're using the original timeline, but just the, the groups involved, they there's no way that they would have gotten along. The Bettini and the, the Weavers are both courted by the Circle of Reason, but never entirely successful uh, successfully. Um, and the Void Engineers, who largely had removed their own programming, used it uh, in their struggles against the technocracy enough that it became unsustainable as a tool for the technocracy. So this was a deliberate, if deceptive, strategy that came about once they knew uh, Threat Null was uh, present to take, uh, take away a, a, a tool that Threat Null could use to control the technocracy. But remember that uh, Threat Null has traveled into the past al uh, along with um, certain leaders, uh, certain technocratic leaders. Uh, the Circle of Reason had a, a largely failed push for members of the technology to rejoin them. That is, they were hoping to get some progenitors and Iteration X to individually leave their conventions and join the Circle. Very few did because the push was made before the general technocratic programming ended. And those who did, uh, there were a lot of infiltrators among them. So, in the current world, the agents and the residents are small cells in the technocracy who are attempting to begin to convert their factions. It takes a while for this to be detected. Um, I have some timelines that I laid out, which I probably won't cover in, uh, in the doc. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I do have them as docs. I'm not going to cover them in this video. Um, the space and the umbra are areas of active three-way conflict, and it may become four-way if Threat Null is uh, purged but not destroyed, and of course there's always an Effendi. Um, so that's what we got. That That's largely the main theming of what we're doing. One of the other things I'm going to do a quick tw quick but big tweak on uh, is the Daughters of Nyx are a, a tradition of enlightened mages uh, who are aligned with the Council of Nine. Their specialty sphere is time. And they draw heavily on depiction of the fates and, and gods of time and cultures across the world. They do blood sacrifice and other forms of ritual to depart from their bodies in time to map possibility around them. Their rituals are dangerous. Uh, the majority, but not quite all, members of the faction are female. In the 1980s, they became to, known as the, uh, as the fatalists. And they often play the role of historians and spies, keeping track of history, gathering secrets on friends and enemies, and save, saving them for future use. Now you might note uh, that the seat of time uh, in the in the main game is not uh, is not vacant, but as a mystery that uh, we're not going to explain in this, uh, they they slip in and take the place of the. Um, uh, of the Cold of Ecstasy. Uh, and in this new timeline, the Cold of Ecstasy never coalesced into a tradition. Its various components actually were orphans. Uh, and just somehow in this target time, they were always there. Um, likewise, Shazar the Seer's influence was never felt throughout the, the tradition in the new timeline because it never became a tradition. Um, and it so that's one of the tweaks we're doing. We're uh, just re visiting the Council of the Nine Traditions. The Akashics, mostly the same, uh, pretty cool. Uh, the Chakravanti, um, there were some major attacks that devastated their tradition in the 1960s. Um, the Celestial Chorus uh, become the Walkers of the Path in uh, the late 90s. Dream Speakers, pretty much the same. The Order of Hermes uh, is mostly the same, but eventually anti-tribu uh, Clan Tremere rejoined the Order um, after discovering rituals that can restore them to life and reattach their avatar. And later on, uh, they come largely to control it. And the uh, Verbena have been steadily increasing in power since the 90s. Uh, there's a lot of cult elements that slip in as well as the Norse flavoring. Note in general that just for the Council of the Nine Traditions, I don't recommend casting them as heroes. Uh, they are meant to be a fail, uh, not failed, a dangerous faction. Uh, they're only vaguely aware of the time shift. And in much later times, uh, the 
uh, Solificati um, emerge from the Order of Hermes and rejoin under their original name, but they are still politically led essentially by the Order of Hermes and the Akashics. Um, but they're, they're aristocratic uh, and they're irresponsible. That's kind of a main theming. They are individualistic to a fault, but dangerously so. The Society of Reason is uh, newly formed. They're primarily focused on protecting human civilization from external threats and uh, spread wondrous science uh, among the masses and to spread the masses into space. And they contend with the technocratic union over the consensus. They're unofficially led by the void engineers who have a off-planet population that they visibly lead. Um, and uh, that's, that's uh, on the COP uh, or Copernic, uh, Copernicus station. Uh, they seek a highly individualistic scientific world. Uh, their paradigm is heroic science. And they look for a consensus that carefully filters the world into threats, detente, and entities that they can coexist with. They have loose ties with the Taftani, the, the weavers. And they also have loose ties with the variety of umbral courts through a, another new faction, the Umbral Diplomats. Uh, but they're, they're composed of the Void Engineers, the Circle of Ether, the uh, Virtualists, um, who uh, is the modern name of the Virtual Adepts, uh, the Umbral Diplomats, and in the 1990s and onwards, the Batini joined them. The uh, Technocratic Union is newly reduced by the loss of the Void Engineers during a nervous Cold War with them while also occasionally courting with them on a unified policy against alien incursion. They, they're newly without a ride to their off-planet territories and they're uh, losing a lot of them and trying not to. They seek a highly centralized scientific world with a consensus that limits most individualist science and excludes fantasy and whimsy. But uh, they recently were largely convinced not to mess with aliens by their uh, leadership returning from the future Iteration X, uh, quick update on them. The computer found and, inter uh, and interfaced with a threat null uh, auto uh, autopolitan kit shortly after it arrived in the past, uh, despite premium uh, shielding around it. It got a read of a possible future and the folly of human wisdom, and it cut off ties from the iterators, gave up on humanity in the entire realm, and uh, Autochthonia left the solar system for deep space with all the humans aboard in tow. Uh, so Iteration X is still around, but it has lost Autochthonia and it has lost the computer. In 2010 and beyond, the maker methodology becomes both a way to compete over the timetable and a great recruitment means for the convention. New World Order is largely trying to cover for a lot of its tactical loss. Uh, progenitors are still around and slowly uh, gaining uh, gaining more prominence. Syndicate is still doing their thing. And from the 2030s and onwards, uh, there's a uh, quantum engineers will, uh, will join them. But uh, I don't cover them in any of the material because they're meant as a future thing. I might someday uh, put together some thoughts. Um, for Threat Null, so the uh, Universal Technocratic Union, uh, currently they're just reduced to agents and residents because those are the ones that hitched a, a ride. Uh, they're the ones that managed to infiltrate and hitch a ride fr uh, from the alternative future. Um, so lifelines were provided to the infiltrators to allow for recreation of their traditions while safely out in space to prevent paradox. But so far they haven't used those kits. Uh, Un unknown to them, the autopolitan kit was scanned by the computer and then disabled. Their goals are to assimilate the current technocratic union and eventually all the sleepers on Earth and bring the fight to those aliens. Uh, so they're aggressive, um, sneaky, and uh, keen to uh, get humanity into a fight that it probably wouldn't win. The Universal Technocratic Union has its own version of control, and it has very no narrow access to some very advanced tech, most of which doesn't work in the consensus of the Earth they understand. Uh, because again, remember the Universal Technocratic Union has the advantage of many thousands of years of development in the original timeline where uh, the original timeline Earth was frozen. Um, 
and the Nefendi uh, are mostly as use, uh, useful. Unfortunately, there uh, there no longer is an Avatar Storm to keep them out. They're a constant threat. Uh, unfortunately for them, the other great threat to humanity as it is, Threat Null, can reliably detect them, as can the Umbral Diplomats. Um, now, you might get a little bit of a laugh out of this. I'm going to call the highly advanced alien species that resulted in the death of humans in the original timeline. They're the uh, Bayesians. They have expertise in, gro in, both mystical, uh, in both mystical and physical warfare. Um, and the instigating incident for the war was avoided in this timeline uh, so far. Although the Universal Technocratic Union, uh, Threat Null, is looking for a round three. They have solid mastery over techniques humans would call spiritual as well as technological. While story-wise, they should kept, be kept very far in the background. They are not particularly beneficent nor vile. They're just pragmatic and capable of punishing or eradicating threats as need be. They find humans largely beneath notice, although if they're irritated enough, uh, they will wipe their out. The storyteller can determine their physical form. Uh, I noted before the Disparate Alliance is non-canonical non in this settings. The groups in it may or may not still exist, but they're considered out of focus. Vampires exist, but they're out of focus. Um, I think I mentioned that... Uh, so, to add a little bit more about Tremere, Goratrex brings the anti-tribu uh, House Tremere back into the Hermetic Order um, after the discovery of a way to return them to life and reattach their avatars. They eventually come to dominate the Hermetic Order by 2001. In this uh, setting, the story of Cain is significantly incorrect and paints a mistaken set of Abrahamic ideas into what actually ha uh, happened. The Abrahamic God is not real in this setting, and the history uh, from the associated texts is just one of many myths, although there was a Cain who ruled a city a long time ago, and he might or might not still be around. Werewolves exist, but are out of focus. The Triot and Gaia are also out of focus, and some of their details are either misunderstood or differently interpreted in this setting. They have a role uh, where it only exists in its current arrangement in our solar system, the Corruptor, the Binder, and Chaos. In other arrangements, uh, in other solar systems, the Triot is not present at all, but there might be equivalents. In terms of uh, the Phara, Nuisha are common both in the Umbra and in the depths of space. The Korax are, uh, are also occasionally seen. Most other Phara are rarely encountered and are out of focus. In terms of the Fae, uh, I do take an opinion on who they were, but they're mostly out of focus. They're the remnant of an earlier great civilization uh, from Earth that ascended to a new reality. Arcadia is permanently sealed from the Tellurian. It may be possible uh, to reach a small number of the true Fae who gatekeep on the far side of it with great effort, but they don't really want anybody crossing over to where they ascended to. They just kind of volunteer to stay behind on the other side of the gate. Um, but yes, they're far out of focus for this setting. Although you can leave some hints uh, as to backstory and to dimensional science geekery uh, but they existed on Earth far before the Triots role was corrupted, and they originally set shape to a lot of the Umbra. In terms of the, the Wraith, I misspelled it as Wrath in this document, goodness. Uh, th uh, they're real, but they're largely out of focus. If you're going to use them, prefer the second edition. Mummies are also way out of focus, but if you're going to use them, use the second edition uh, rules and story. Uh, uh, the problem with Mummy the Resurrection is that it unifies Mummy into this annoying paradigm of struggle between two souls and one person, and I just don't think that's an interesting paradigm. Uh, and it just re removes some of the interesting distinctiveness of Mummy, so I just mark it as non-canon, partly out of spite. Um, let's see, let's briefly mention the Umbral Diplomats. Uh, so their primary sphere is Mind. In the, uh, in the Circle of Reason. Originally, they started as a misinformation project by the Void Engineers. They were kind of a hoax. Uh, and then they had some initial members that were primarily infiltrators from a variety of other organizations. But later on, they were joined by some remnants of the Soil Guild from the Craft Masons and an ancient line of Bardic Mages and some other random grab bags. Uh, their ideas are that war should be expensive, peace should be profitable, 
RP should be the most profitable. Our rules smooth the course of history, and we've known all the pieces on the board for centuries. So they're a faction of spies and diplomats. They're primarily composed of spies from other groups. Uh, people always enter their ranks with an agenda, perhaps uh, even with some hostility to the broad diplomats, but they're set up in a way so that over time, as somebody climbs the ladder, they mostly give up on their agenda or they find a way to make their agenda compatible with that of service in the Emperor uh, Diplomats. Um, leaks usually serve their interests. Um, their interests are primarily the survival of humanity and the other current residents of Earth through redu reduction of conflict, and secondarily, a certain amount of personal wealth. It's rare that they commit violence per se, although a lot of what they do should range from creepy to horrific. Not all of them are awakened humans, so not all of them have access to the same abilities, uh, but uh, so I document a few powers available to awakened uh, or to, uh, enlightened humans and a few umbral spirits who are close enough to being human. Um, teams of um, uh, umbral diplomats are usually heterogeneous ish in their skill sets. So if you have some UDs working together, usually they're going to be either mostly human or mostly whatever something else is. Uh, they're. Um, their types, you have body surfers who focus on mind and life. They research key individuals in order to, as needed, take control of them during key moments in history to sign treaties or avoid conflict. Uh, at their most uh, benign, they might grow replacement bodies, which they can use to let them be in multiple places at once, more or less. Really, they just uh, uh, do rapid transit through uh, puppets as controlling them exactly at the same time is quite different. You also have quantum shapers who are uh, focused on mind and time. They identify criminals, dangerous infiltrators, and key people prepare, uh, and collect information to prepare them for manipulation or for the body surfers. They often work with void engineers for where nonviolent options to remove problems are not viable, and they act as police on Cap uh, Copernicus uh, uh, Station. Um, Exploration-minded umbral diplomats often do either spirit or dimensional science and pair with etherites or void engineers, or they have their own vessels for first encounters. Uh, the, these, uh, they, they find it much easier to be there first for diplomacy. They draft treaties for behavior, trade, and consensus on humanity's behalf. They leave beacons, burning summaries of these treaties into the minds of any other humans who may turn up later. Uh, Diplomacy-minded um, umbral diplomats often take the correspondence sphere. And uh, in the distant past, there was a, a bardic uh, group. This previously was the majority. Uh, they're now rare. Uh, basically, the, the umbral diplomats have been around for a long time. They just weren't uh, associated with anybody. Um, but they've been around from the mythic ages to the late Victorian and they were trying to guide human history towards their varied ends using bardic magic with entertainers speaking poetry, raps, things like that to summarize past or future events and bend the minds, decisions and memories of people around them. Uh, later, they reemerged in the form of uh, poets uh, to spread influence in less intimate ways and uh, both their nature and wide acceptance of their presence and craft shielded them significantly from paradox. Umbral diplomats do a lot of travel, often in space, and they generally don't trust each other, particularly at low, lower levels of the organization. Their dominant ship design is a large frame into which individual vessels uh, for each uh, umbral diplomat are either docked or orbiting. Frame provides mobility, uh, it uh, provides propulsion, and individuals usually stay in their smaller vessel Although they, they're able to leave any time they feel at risk from their fellow uh, UDs, so they might pull out of the frame. Ships tend not to be well armed because they're primarily diplomats and courtesans and occasionally assassins. They're not warriors. They rely on etherites and void engineers for less diplomatic solutions to problems. They do a lot of trade. Maybe uh, They also dabble in producing art, music, fine culture. By the 1970s, they've developed reliable ways to detect threat null and the Nefandi, uh, among other things, but they guard this technology as zealously as void engineers guard their task units. They're also believed to have ways of measuring loyalty among their members, with advancement significantly 
being tied to being measured. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's maybe skip that. Uh, what else do we want to cover? Because um, I, I have a lot of documents on this, uh, on the setting. Uh, oh yeah, I'll briefly cover the, the unwoven lands. Uh, so this is a, a, another mostly detached set of ideas about Mage Ascension that wouldn't have to be used with all this other stuff. So the idea here is that in early times, features of the planet Earth were not bound together into a grid to the degree that they are in modern times. Places and lands uh, existed in a greater abundance than today, and moving from one place to another was a working of the will as much as the feet. Maps were always provisional, and reality was often pretty flexible. Two people with a different map at the same place traveling separately might each reach the area that their map says, rather than uh, tra traversing some real, completely physical space. And a long journey for the unawakened was often an invitation to get lost forever. But that was in early times. Roads uh, were invented and connected places to each other reliably and became early strands to limit possibilities. Uh, so, and explorers and surveyors, both in the order of reason and its more ancient and modern counterparts, slowly bound the surface of the planet together into maps and resolved those maps into what largely became one reality. Islands, towns, and even cities ended up being left out from those maps. Sometimes they were intentionally excluded over the years, uh, too many mystical elements, politics. Uh, sometimes as a result of hard choices, uh, in order to make parsimonious maps. By the late 1800s, the modern globe was largely fixed, but then by the 1950s, it became hard to step into variant areas accidentally. And the inner earth, uh, its remaining easy connections are primarily to the unwoven lands. So the unwoven lands are uh, parts of the Tellurian uh, on earth that were not chosen to be woven into consensual reality. They're generally outside the reach of most of the te technocracy, which has a very minimal presence out there. It's unclear if they contribute to the consensus. Um, they, life on them is a lot like living elsewhere on Earth, except that you are not part of the, the map of the world. It's hard to reach you. It might be hard for you to reach other places, but certainly the consensus reality is elsewhere. Some locations are closer to mundane reality and think of themselves as belonging to uh, a country. Although the, the tax collectors never come and they never seem to get around to visiting those well-known places. A small few manage to occasionally visit a neighboring town that is part of consensual reality. The un unwoven lands are a popular place for traditionalists and uh, 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 to reside who lack the power uh, to uh, to create connections to enter a uh, horizon uh, realm. Entry and egress from these places is generally easy if you're um, a traditionalist. Uh, paradox is often weaker, sometimes absent out there, but there are also realms that are further from mundane reality. Those are harder to reach directly and they may have, uh, many have become lost over time. There's a lot of lost islands and places that don't fit the modern geography, a lot of trade posts, some of them have relatively modern technology, others underwent slow technological decay. Uh, generally, to modern perspectives, these would be seen as small and large places surrounded by mists, waters, or woods that don't have a stable mapping, and they're malleable to intent in terms of trying to reach other places. There are a few alternative weavings that are quite distant from the familiar consensual reality, and some of these may effectively be Everett volumes. Who did the weaving? Earlier, just uh, magi of many kinds who built roads between places all over the world, a lot of disorganized efforts, even some unenlightened uh, humans. Later on, magi involved in trades who were attached to powerful kingdoms and their empires, particularly in the Roman Empire. And then when we enter the Order of Reason era, the soil guild of the craft, maker, uh, craft masons, uh, and later the, the void seekers, the Order of the Grail and the scribes of Apollo, were doing it. They were deciding what to keep in, what to leave out. And in the post craft mason era, uh, era, the weavers of the world uh, were active outside of the consensus. And those are the remnants of the craft ma uh, masons. Uh, uh, see Rafai, 
um, and a few void seekers. They're now independent of the conventions and they're just out there maintaining the divide between the uh, the uh, woven world, that is the, the parts that are uh, part of the consensus Tellurian and the bits outside. They, uh, they, main uh, they manage the border and they do a certain amount of very light mapping of the areas between um, uh, uh, of the various areas out there. Um, so the Outer Walkers are an independent and largely unknown convention with very little presence in consensual reality. They often will fight Nefendi, try and keep them from wandering into uh, main reality and also just fight them in general. And they work on perfecting the weaving, um, although some less sanctioned groups work on alternative weavings. So, they're, so, so those are their tasks. They maintain a limited contact with modern day void engineers, but they're uh, highly decentralized. Uh, they, had, uh, they have an ancient headquarters in uh, Balthia that about a quarter of them pay attention to. The rest of them don't really, uh, uh, they don't have any particular loyalty to any centralized place. What are people like out there? They're just largely untouched by the technocracy. There's no large nations. Uh, they don't really have nationalism very much. Many of them are just sleepy lost towns. A few of them are lost parts of older empires. Um, are there awakened there? People out there awaken about as often as they do in consensual reality, but the conventions have very little presence there. Crafts and traditions are somewhat present, including some that are largely defunct in consensual reality. It's also not rare that mages who know about the, these places retire there at whatever age. Is there a gauntlet and how well do they connect to the rest of cosmology? There's a very weak gauntlet between uh, the un unwoven lands and the, the woven ones. Uh, there are shallow, uh, shallow wings and people can get lost and stumble across. It's a lot easier to, uh, to fall out of consensual rea reality than to, uh, uh, than to make your way back into consensual reality. Um, they're still fully connected to the rest of the cosmology, but generally in places that are much more distant from the normal connections. Um, and it's pretty rare that you would encounter people from the unwoven lands when you're out in the Umbra, if you're from the, the main consensual reality. So travelers often need to have more knowledge in order to reach the specific places that they went through. In terms of paradox, um, uh, the, so they, they largely fooled, uh, follow the rules of scourge and backlash depending on local reliefs. Um, there are some areas that are friendly to bygones. There are many areas that are not. So creatures like dragons would probably still struggle to maintain themselves in most places. Um, Nefendi have been kept out of these lands since the era uh, when they were patrolled by craft masons. And there are no known areas where they have a significant presence. How aware are the denizens of the normal consensual reality? This varies a lot. Some operate under the assumption that they could travel to well-known real-world locations with little difficulty, although they never bother. Uh, they generally uh, just stay in their small town or alternate town. Uh, but this is more uh, common for areas that were written out of reality more recently. Uh, others have little awareness of mainstream reality. That's the unwoven realms. Uh, I, have a, I have a whole lot more on, on all this. This is just largely meant to cover some of the big interesting ideas. Uh, do what you like with these. I think I have shared this in the past on Google Drive. I, I'll probably stick a link to the, my Google Drive docs folder in the description of this video. But um, and you'll be able to read anything more that you like. Take whatever ideas you like. Again, uh, if if you're going to be running a campaign, uh, I, I think you should feel entirely comfortable whether a an author likes it or not. Just grab ideas, tweak them, twist them, add stuff, remove stuff, whatever seems right to you. This is mostly meant to be food for thought. Yeah, it might seem a little fanfic-ish uh, here and there. Uh, or maybe just it totally reeks of it and I just can't tell because I wrote it. 
but um, but yeah, I, I just hope it, it inspires some interesting thoughts and people might grab some of it uh, and do something interesting with it. I know that Mage Ascension is not a uh, tabletop game that ever really hit it big. There's a community out there, but the problem is probably that the the game is it's just complicated to run uh, for a lot of reasons. And also it doesn't help that uh, the new stewards of it since the, the White Wolf area don't seem to be particularly good at uh, doing what they do. And they have a lot of the modern, annoying political agenda, cultural reform stuff that kind of started in 2007-ish. Uh, anyhow, uh, do what you like with it. Uh, I hope it's somewhat interesting. And that is probably all I'm going to say right now about that. Um, if there are any questions or thoughts, I'm happy to hear them. Oh, one, one other thing. Note that the docs, I've been chewing on them bit by bit over a long time, and they're, they're, I probably am not entirely consistent between them. Looking at the dates on the docs, some of them I started near the end of 2019. Some of them were uh, like... Uh, I think the last one that I did serious work on was in mid-2022. And so a lot of this stuff is not uh, not entirely consistent. So you might need to go through and look for... Uh, you might need to go through and look for uh, inconsistencies and fix some stuff. But again, if you're really thinking about using any of this stuff, which you might not... Uh, then you're you're probably going to have to fill in a lot of details anyhow. So hopefully that won't be too daunting a task. Anyhow, uh, bye bye.